great. Thank you very much for the chance to interview you about what you do at 1033. It's my pleasure. So can you tell me, what does 1033 do? 1033 is a disaster uh, and emergency planning and management organization. We're trying to work not just with the government, because as we know right now, every concentration has been on the government. 1033 wants to bring that to the next level so that it's business and community all combined together to create uh, what I call a trilobal symbiosis of recovery and resiliency within a community. So that we do it together. We do it together and that way we overlap and there's nothing missed. I worked as an NGO coordinator when some refugees came to Canada and we had 30 plus agencies and uh, I found it remarkable how some were very good at housing and others were good at helping kids get their education going to keep them busy in the camp while we helped them sort out health issues and registration and they'd escaped a war zone and a, and, and a Red Cross camp they'd been in for a long time. But it was fascinating the lack of coordination at the same time. Coordination is what's missing in all of those areas in every aspect of emergency preparedness and the response aspect. Now, while 1033 doesn't go out with a truck, say, and support with bringing this piece of product in or this support su uh, supplies in, we are there to talk through, to guide, to help people find the right pathway to the resiliency, to the recovery that comes. And those two, resiliency and recovery, are part of the five pillars right. of emergency preparedness. And I would assume that part of your planning means it minimizes the risk. Oh, it does. Uh, have, in North America, we've built a medical center on a fault line in one state in the U.S. and in Canada. We, we have, have two nuclear, nuclear plants. A nuclear plants on a... On a, on a, on a <laughs> alongside <laughs> alongside um, a major fault yes. in the St. Lawrence Valley Rift, yes. and also built on the Peterborough... Uh, Niagara magnetic lineament, which is a magnetic stressor within the soils. Again, it could trigger too. So, so my, I had a geology teacher who, who in the day sold 50,000, 60,000 copies of his book, and he was quite a bright light in the geology world. And he said, the trouble with humans is we think in terms of five years, five months, five minutes, five hours. And he said, geology could be stable apparently to the humans for a thousand years, but then in the course of just a few hours, there's nothing standing. Everything changes. And the Mount Helen explosion proved that. And what's developing at Yellowstone National Park is also yes, a perfect example. Very scary. 100,000, 200,000 years since the last eruption. And they're still, they figure, maybe about 1,000 years till it's due. But ge <laughs> geology doesn't work on a neat clock. Geology's clock is suited to its metabolism. And, and geology is a lot slower than and ours. we know nothing. I mean, I was just born the year Hurricane Hazel. Mm -hmm. I'm that old. <laughs> and I remember my parents saying they came to look at their new house that was being built. And every house there, the ground was so saturated that every house was filled to the earth level with water. And it was running off and several people in the neighborhood drowned. Uh, I've collected a series of really interesting photographs from the period that have been sent to me by by fellow people in business continuity and simply through what you find on the internet and it's incredible. And so even though hurricanes didn't come this far north, we got told, 54 was a big one. And it almost happened again. Yes, and it could have. And so I had friends that overreacted. They didn't travel for a day and a half. And I had friends that pretended it wasn't coming and it was no biggie. And I said, well, a couple hundred bucks in cash in case the system crashes, the banking system crashes, is wise. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to live in my house for two days and not go out because I have weather stations, Environment Canada, and if it's still nine hours away and I'm going to a one-hour event, I feel pretty safe that just 20 minutes away I can go there. Worst case scenario, I can walk home. Mm -hmm. And I have three routes to walk home, so I'm not going to go through that deep valley, which is a, a flood zone mm -hmm. at the 50-year mark, never mind the 1,000-year mark. So people need to know that there's choices. And if you've done your homework, you've done your planning, you've done your preparation, the resiliency from that comes really easy. You've tackled the hardest part there is. You're prepared for the very worst, so that when the small stuff happens... I lived through the Toronto blackout a few years ago when the eastern seaboard collapsed electronic, electrically. I remember that. 
And so I found it very interesting living in a high rise, or as my friends tease me, I'm a cliff dweller. <laughs> and we had people that didn't own a can opener, mm -hmm. except electric, and the electric didn't work. So they had a cupboard full of canned goods because they were smart enough to put away a week to a month's worth of food and drag food, but no way to open it. No way to open it. And you know, I'm in reasonable shape. But you asked me to go to the 14th and the 19th floor six times in two days. <laughs> th these old bones start talking after a while. It gets to be a bit much. And so I'm on a tenants advisory group, and we're saying to the tenants, you should have three days of highly accessible food, and you just buy new every 30 to 90 days, depending on what the food is. And you replace, and you just part of your food rotation. may get really boring, but one of the best foods that you can put in that kind of a kit is the prepared macaroni and cheese dinners. If you've got something to boil the water, you've got a pot to boil it in and a little bit of milk. That's really all you need. You can even do away with the margarine or the butter, whichever you choose, but you've got the basics of what you really need to get you through. Most of my neighbors in a high-rise are dependent on everything to be perfect. Some have food, some have water, and I'm thinking, well, I grew up in the country. You always have a few days of something kicking around. I got a month's worth of water in the storage unit. Mm -hmm. Now, if a storm comes unexpectedly, I might have trouble getting to it. <laughs> but not a lot of hurricanes flood us out on zero notice. No, and you'll have some. Notice. And You're I'm 600, 800 feet above the, the big bodies of water in my area, so I... You're not going to get flooded out. So, I, the work you do, so how do, how, how do people engage you? What do, they, what do they do for that? They can reach me by very many uh, different resources. They can, our, uh, our website's up. Um, describes the basics of what they need, so uh, with automatic uh, fill in the form, sends the email directly to me with all the specifics of the okay. questions that they want. Okay. Um, telephone, email, okay. uh, whichever way. So it's all that's all easy. So then you help them put a plan together based on their physical location, industry type. Yeah, um, all the things that I take into into account is is where they are geologically. Um, if they're closer down to say Ash Ridges Bay in Toronto, uh, the beaches area, the one thing we have to take into account down there is very, very sandy soils. Um, if they're further up, we might be having to think about uh, granites, if they're in further up northern Ontario. Uh, we want to know where the old floodplains were that once hit the city. Most of those are covered over, nobody's too sure where they are. Big water comes through, they could collapse again. Uh, cliffs, bluffs, all those things are taken into account. And then the actual home or business building itself, how it was built, when it was built, and how it's been maintained. And having somebody in the building industry, they tell me in the last couple of years the wind tolerance standards have changed for the province of Ontario because wind shear, mm -hmm. wind speed, mm -hmm. we're either measuring more accurately or it's getting stronger. I think the answer is it's probably getting stronger. If we look at uh, the historical patterns of Tornado Alley, which used to be centered mostly in the southern United States, middle of the continent, it's not there anymore. It's spread further north, it's spread further east, and it's wider than it's ever been in the past as well. Sad truth is, Ontario is part of Tornado Alley, especially southern Ontario. Winds are picking up. We're seeing more instances of smaller tornadoes touching down in the GTA. My daughter was born on the uh, Barry tornado date back in May in the 80s. Yeah, not fun. And all I remember is phoning co-workers who were all supposed to be driving home from a meeting that had would have gone directly into it. Mm. Luckily, they were all safe. But yeah. they all told me that it changes everything. It does. They said it's one thing to go to sea and live in a... A couple of them had been sailors and lived through large squalls on boats not designed for them because it was just a day sail <laughs> in good weather and the storm came up. But they said to go through a tornado, when you see two by fours whistling past you, and it could have easily gone through the middle of the car and killed you, and they said you really can't see past an inch or two past the windshield. He said, it's not dark out, there's an absence of light. That's right. You turn on the little light in the car, you can't see your hands really. You know they're there, but there's an absence of light. He said it's the strangest thing to try to describe to somebody who didn't experience it. And you're talking about the two-by-fours going through the air. There's a popular comedian 
from the southern United States. And his famous line from one of his shows was, it's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. So I laugh, but I had, an, I had a friend who's, whose parent was literally, they had a Quonset hut big enough for bulldozer, backhoe, and other various construction equipment. He ran into the Quonset hut, and he said to his spouse, because they're screaming as they can see it coming, under the bulldozer. No, f never, f never found him. 240-pound guy, prime of life, disappeared. So emergency planning is not for the weak of heart. It's a must-do. It is a must-do. And so ge <clears throat> geological location, type of building, type of industry. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my prospective clients, because this is your expertise, not mine, but I said, you don't have any security. I said, well, why would we? And you know, within two years, they had 24 laptops stolen off their, out of their offices. Somebody came in with a hockey bag. They remembered that. He delivered flowers. That was a ruse to get in. Mm -hmm. And then he filled the laptop up and walked out. Lunch hour. Came in at lunch hour. So I don't remember reading about it in the news, and I was probably not supposed to know, but somebody wrote me back and said, they never listened, and it cost us 24 laptops. But worse still is the work and the private information on the laptops. And they're lucky that it was only laptops. If they had been a major, major manufacturer with chemical products on site, chemicals that could have been dangerous to the general public, chlorines, gases off-gassing from the chlorines, um, ammonium nitrate, all of that sort, could have got into the wrong hands and you'd be used by somebody who knows how to use them to hurt somebody or to cause damage to the specific facility. So you help them put a checklist, an audit together, a process to overcome it, mm -hmm or to prevent it, or should there be something outside of their control? To mitigate it. To mitigate it, okay. Yeah. Okay, so... If you can't prevent it, you want to mitigate. You want to make it as harmless as is possible, even though there's still going to be some damage come from it. So that's, I remember reading that uh, the city of Aurora renovated an old schoolhouse mm -hmm. with federal money, and what they've done is it now is uh, upgraded to the current earthquake standards tornado standards, and in a, in a worst case scenario, it would make an, a, a perfect emergency center hub for police, fire, ambulance, heaven forbid the military. And so I know our Minister of Finance was very impressed that money went to do something that looks so elegant, and yet all the infrastructure upgrades are hidden. It still looks, for the most part, like a 19th, 18th century schoolhouse. Schools. Except that if you talk to people that know, it's got all this hidden assets. So, and you look at the average construction of anything that's been built since, I'd say, the mid-70s to early 80s. So many manufacturing and warehousing buildings actually could have a double purpose in just that area, in response as a place for registration for firefighters and first responders, a temporary shelter, temporary storage, but we don't cooperate back and forth. We don't. We have mutual uh, assist agreements between municipality and municipality. We don't think about mutual assist between government and business. With the, uh, the east coast of Canada, we had the big storm in Newfoundland that, that washed out those roads. Yes. And isolated communities. And I thought it was wonderful and generous, but the major grocery chain out there, Sobeys, that sent truckloads of fresh water, bottled water. Mm -hmm. The environmentalist in me goes, bottled water? And, oh, well, they have to get the first 10 days of water. There's no roads. There's 50-foot holes, 100 feet wide. I would rather see somebody with three drops to, a gal or to two gallons worth of water of bleach to sterilize and purify water after running it through a coffee filter than see somebody cracking open individual bottles of water. Well, that was their reaction. It was, <clears throat> it, was, it was a start to understanding. But again, who built roads in a way that with a major water, who approved that? That with a major flood, not a, not, not, not a tornado, not a hurricane, just a good, a mighty blow, that that amount of rain could wash out culverts and... Let me see until you've actually seen it happen once, you think it's not within the realm of possibility. And that's the current state everywhere. It doesn't happen here. doesn't happen to me. I, 
lived rural Ontario. We won't say where because I don't wish to embarrass anyone that, <laughs> that sees this because there are people directly attributable. I could trace it back to the approval. But there was a large body of water built up because beavers built some dams. For those of you not familiar with the rodents' construction skills, they can build dams that hold back four feet, six feet, eight feet of water. I haven't seen eight foot dams. I'm told they can go higher if they have enough building material. I saw 15 out in uh, uh, Banff National Park. So what happened? There was a, a, a spring rain. Their dam was soft, hadn't been maintained. The beavers were just coming out of hibernation. The dam burst. It blew the road out and two people drowned. That's all it takes. And so it was quite fascinating. It, sad for the two people, but you know, the engineer that said, oh, it's just a beaver dam. <laughs> Again, my famous geology teacher, double speed of water. It's nine times more powerful, I believe. Mm -hmm. Triple speed of water, 27 times more powerful. Mm -hmm. When we had the big big storm in Toronto a few years ago, we had some microbursts. And the building I live in, in the basement, there's uh, metal plating covering off drainage holes where they used to clean out the drains, the sewer drains from right. around the building. All the sand and the salt collects in these two, three great big holes. Yeah. And they've got thick metal plate. The surge was so strong that there was like a like a fountain effect, and the metal plate was moved six feet away. Oh yeah. So management doesn't understand this, and so I said just replace it with grating, and bolt the grating down. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of flow of water. Water is still going to come up and do what it's going to do. Otherwise, you risk the hydrostatic pressure damaging the concrete. And it will. So just give it. They've never replaced it. Oh, it was a fluke. It didn't really. No, no. So give it time. Oh yeah, unfortunately. So auditing to prevent, auditing to minimize. What else? There are lots of aspects. Um, you have to test. You ah. have to exercise. You've got your plan in. You've put it on your, sh your shelves. And that's the problem. This particular plan is designed for government. But a business plan is not going to be very much different and not a whole lot thinner. Oh, I got my plan. It's all done. There it goes. It's up on the executive shelf. <laughs> done. We're my clear. insurance people are happy. Exactly. Comes the disaster. Where's the plan? I gotta find this section in the bike. No. You've got the plan. Everybody who's involved with your emergency response team needs to read the plan. Needs to understand the plan. Needs to drill to see what does and doesn't work in the plan. If something doesn't work when you've had your exercise in it, you want to change up your exercise. Sometimes it's going to be talking like you and I are right now. Sometimes it's going to be around a table. Or you're going to do a mock disaster where you have phone-ins, but you're still within an office space. You're not actually going in. Or you can do a full exercise where you're actually physically testing how things are working. That's going to weed out where the shortcomings in the plan are. There's going to be things you didn't think of. Um, you've got trees down in a municipality and you've got a crew of 14 guys who can go out and take care of it, but did you think about the guys that are going to be on vacation? Did you make allowances for the guy that got hurt? Did you make allowances for the equipment that's not working properly? Have you maintained all of the equipment so that it's going to? You'll find where the shortcomings are. One gentleman said, that's all good, but we forgot that when the power goes out, we can't get gasoline to fuel the truck, to fuel the chainsaws, to clear the roads for the other vehicles. That's been seen so many times. It's not funny across North America. We have a big store underground of all of the fuel we'll need for our trucks and our vehicles and our equipment. Great! Did you put in a generator to power the pumps that are going to pump the gasoline out? Did you make allotment, an allowance for fuel for that generator? Because most of them don't run on gasoline, they run on diesel. During the blackout, again, exactly. I, I, I live in a major facility that a long, not that long ago, it was thirty odd million dollars. Uh, they only had two days of diesel, mm -hmm. and no, and they didn't even know who they should talk, call to fill it up. <laughs> and consumers need to think too. So there was no emergency lighting in the buildings exactly. after two days because the batteries ran flat because the generator wasn't running after three days, I guess, because the generator kicked in. The emergency lights have their own back battery backup for those five minute blackouts we all have. Usually, those batteries are good for anywhere from two. To eight hours. Well, after three days, we had people <laughs> with paper newspaper torches trying to climb 20 stories. Oh, that's a bad thing. I mean, just dangerous. Dangerous. And when it comes to the fuel, the other thing you have to remember again, too, is 
there may be gasoline at a gas station who has a generator, who has the battery backup. His tanks may not be empty, but he's required under municipal codes to reserve a certain amount in those fuel tanks for emergency vehicles. And I learned that the hard way on that particular oh. disaster. I was heading in to my business, place of business at the time, the employer I worked for, and I was low on gas, so I figured I'd stop on my way because I knew there would be a, this particular gas station open. And so did about 10,000 other people who were in the area. And traffic coming in and out of that zone, and specifically that gas station, was horrendous. I said to the guy, I'll make you a deal. You save me five gallons, or five liters, I'll help you direct traffic. I held up my end of the bargain, and I directed traffic for six hours. He gave me a couple of bottles of water and a bag of chips to tide me over. I wish he had honored the part about saving me the five liters. Unfortunately, he didn't. He had to reserve the rest for the for ambulance and police and fire and ordered me to push my car off his property. So I learned my lesson there. Yeah, that's a big lesson. Well, I took a bottle of water. We had people directing traffic at the intersection near me, which is rated one of the ten busiest intersections in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did that for four hours. Then the police came along. There's no street lights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's summer. It's getting kind of dark. We don't want you getting killed trying to be helpful. And as this intersection is the first one off the highway, People have been going 80 to 190, 160 kilometers an hour. Yep. It's a little lawless when the juice went <laughs> off. We don't want them coming off the highway and just tearing through. And the average Joe doesn't have the high visibility vests. So. They had nothing but little pen lights. And that's not going to cut it. No, so I got them water twice, and mm -hmm. then I just retreated home to stay safe. But it was really something to see. It is. And to find out how ill-prepared. Granola bars get boring after three days. They but, do. But dehydrated cranberries and fruit, we have a lot of that in the house. Did find the chocolate bar stash from Halloween we forgot about. <laughs> and you just make sure you reconstitute those dehydrated cranberries prior to eating them and drinking water. Yes, yes, because they tend to expand. And it's very rude. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, this is good. This is Because this is, a very, to me, a very necessary skill set that we have to get out into the community, have talks about. I was at a school when they practiced an emergency lockdown. Mm -hmm. A teacher puts an armband on, and they're the perpetrator of something. They don't mm -hmm. get, they don't want us to scare anybody, but they were practicing lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I was really impressed. And uh, that Board of Education gets it. And it's a great thing to have, especially in light of what's just happened in Sandy Hook. Um, we need <clears throat> we need to talk about it. We need to deal with it. I worked in a restaurant. We got. Or I mean a gas station, the restaurant came later, and we got robbed. And I was the one that got pointed out, who's in charge today? Me! <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 no follow-up, no plan, no, and I no. look back and think, wow, what were they thinking? And the, the interesting thing too when you're doing the planning for schools with the kids, they are so much more resilient to this kind of thing in their face. Oh. Than we are up into our 50s and, and, and as we get older. it Yes, it's very hurtful to, their, to who they are initially, but they do have that capacity to get by it, especially when we can give them the guidance to help them get past it. And the best way we can do that is let our children know, without frightening them, of course, nothing is fair in the world, nothing is always going to be safe in the world, so the best way to protect yourself, no what to do when that bad thing comes, when the bad thing happens. And then what we need to do is take the steps to prepare them. So now our Premier is looking at into the schools, let's put in the additional security. Mr. Premier, if you see it, call me please, because I don't think the, the right way to go about it is just to go in and start throwing all these locks on the doors and put in the procedures. Higgledy-piggledy, just knee-jerk reaction. Worst thing they could do. Each school has its own characteristics. You've got schools in Ontario. The oldest one I'm aware of has been in service since 1939. The way it's built and designed and laid out is very different to the way schools that are being built today are laid out and designed. Some are harder to get around, some are easier to get around. Let's take a survey of the schools. Let's take a mean. Look at all the various types. Come up with a generalized assumption and let's work to that 
to put in a proper safety and emergency response protocol. It could be doors, it could be, you know, instead of a key lock like they have on the doors right now, why not go to a maglock programming system? The doors are automatically unlocked at 8 o'clock to let the kid, 8.30 to let the children in. As soon as the bell rings, they automatically lock from the outside and requires a buzzer to push in. But when it's recess time, you don't want the kids having to hit the barriers to get out because that's going to concern them. The program goes out, unlocks the doors. The kids still feel that free mm -hmm. in and out. Yep. But there's also the comfort knowing that it's secured for them. And these systems, every single one that I've ever witnessed, as soon as that fire alarm goes off, all of them are unlocked. Everybody gets out. Yeah. So they're not a hazard. I think it's a good idea to put some planning in there. But there's one thing that's going to have to come in after we do all the planning to mitigate, to prevent, for recovery and resilience. We still have to review what we've learned after every test, after every real event. Review what happened and then make the necessary revisions. And, and we have to... You're right, because we don't <clears throat> talk. So I'll go back to the Red River floods. By not talking, many wonderful people paid a large price. We burnt people out because it was taboo to talk about having problems from major incidents. So no plan, you know, lack of planning, and there was all these burnouts and all these divorces and bankruptcies. Sure. And it got ugly, and so we need to plan in advance at a corporate level, government level, yeah. but at a community level. We're, we have a very interesting psyche as Canadians. We don't talk about the bad things. We don't like to discuss them and dwell on the negative because we don't want to upset people. But the problem is, is when you upset people, or you try not to upset people, they don't know what to do. And that's when you jeopardize lives. And I think that's the valuable service, as you reduce the jeopardy to lives oh, yeah. and infrastructure. And makes a powerful difference. And it could save marriages. It might not save marriages. Can't tell until something actually happens. Some people will respond differently. And one client took one of these. Yes. Uh, thanks to the generosity of their realtor, who purchased it for them from me, went through the entire place. I found a couple of things in the building that were a little of concern to me, and I let them know about it. In the end, one was very concerned about everything. The other one said, it's panic mongering to sell a product. And unfortunately, they didn't make it through. Uh, about six months after being in the home, they split. Mm. Plan for the worst. Know you can do what's right. And then you really don't have to worry that much. Just well, make sure you keep up on it, what's in here. It reduces the risk. And reducing risk reduces stress. It, to go back to driver's education as an analogy, Long look, short look, long look, short look. This is a long and a short look for safety. It is. At the infrastructure level and the community level, and it's, it's a needed thing. And for the home, they're not expensive. This is designed to help people. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It is this my has pleasure. Been, been wonderful you to meet you. It. Thank you. Uh,